So there's two cases, Flandera, it's the fourth appellate department, so it's the second level appellate case from 2010, and then there's another one, Allstate v. Credit SWE, which is Supreme Court, New York County, 2014. And these cases talk about appraisers and fraud, and I think this is very, very interesting and subtle, and I just, I spent a lot of time thinking about it, and I think it's important, tell me later if you think it's not important. So, fraud. In general, appraisers can't usually be sued for fraud and have that stick. Why? Because the essence of an appraisal is an opinion, and fraud requires a misrepresentation of material facts. So in general, fraud isn't something that sticks. In particular, the court said, fraud claims based on appraisals have been dismissed on the ground, and an appraisal is a subjective opinion and not actionable absent an allegation that the appraiser did not believe the appraisal at the time it was issued. So, if, I, if something is blue and I say it's red and you depend on that, that can be fraud. It's, it's an objective fact. I have a friend who I used to always set up with girls. And I would say they were pretty. And he would say that they were not pretty. And I mean, he can't sue me for fraud because it's, it's subjective. So an appraisal is more like the setup than it is, but there are three exceptions that I've pulled out of these different cases of where an appraiser can get sued for fraud. All right, number one is um, in the Flandera case covers that. Um, I'm in the middle of page 20 under the court's holding and reasoning. Although appraisers or other assessments of market value are akin to statements of opinion, which generally are not actionable, an assessment of market value that is based upon misrepresentations concerning existing facts may support a cause of action for fraud. So, if, if, if I'm saying something is pretty because it's red, that might be my opinion, and, and you might not be able to show that I didn't believe my opinion. But if the thing was actually blue, and I knew it was blue, I've misrepresented the underlying fact, and that could give rise to a cause of action for fraud. And in one of the, um, let me see, page 37 is where this all state case is. Hold on. Just one. Mm, no, I don't really care for that. Okay, so um, a second way that you can get in trouble for fraud is if there was such a custom, if, if, if the appraisal so deviated from standard appraisal practice and standards. So if they wildly deviate, and it's almost like you threw out all the standards of appraisals, then that can also subject you to fraud. And that's what was happening in the Allstate B Credit SWE case. So that is 2014 here in New York County, and it was a fraud action. So this is, this kind of in a way, I didn't want to miss this because this sort of builds off the Wamu thing. It's a, a residential mortgage-backed security case. And we see a ton of those, not so much in our practice, but I read about them in the paper every day in the commercial part of the uh, Supreme Court in Manhattan. So residential mortgage-backed securities, of course, they're pools of mortgages that got put together and sold as securities to investors. And in this case, Allstate purchased $231 million of these from Credit Suisse. And now they are suing for what? for fraud, fraudulent inducement, and negligent misrepresentations. And one of the things that was allegedly mis misrepresented was, court, was of course the loan to value ratio arrived at um, by using appraisers that were not created using sound data is the allegation. So in this case, um, the court pointed to both things, that there was a systematic disregard to standard appraisals, to, to a regular appraisal standards, and also that the appraisals were based on data that was just wrong. So if, if you, and it refers to a case in here where um, what they were looking at was, um, 
the, 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 they misrepresented that the house got municipal water. They misrepresented the type of basement. They misrepresented something about ownership, which I'm not clear why that would be an appraisal issue and not a title issue, but that's what got misrepresented. So in that case, these appraisers got uh, causes of action sustained against them for fraud. Um, and I guess also you could, that's really kind of where, it's an earlier case that I hope we double back to, but another, another way an appraiser can get in trouble for fraud is if they can prove you didn't believe your own opinion, which the Wamu case was, was, was of that ilk because they had emails and different evidence that showed a chain where pressure was put and then the changes happened. So I think a very important thing I wanted to say about fraud is one of those words that's bandied about. Oh, fraud. He committed a fraud. People always want to sue for fraud. The thing is, is that fraud as a legal concept has, has a couple of aspects. The fact that there was pressure put on the appraisers, the problem, um, the problem when, when the, it's a standard thing that appraisals get sued for and usually they're okay because the court says that, well, yes, there was pressure. We can document that there was pressure, but pressure alone doesn't make a cause of action for fraud. What you also need is that the appraiser succumbed to the pressure. So that's where you have to show some kind of connection between pressure and then change that's unexplainable. So those are the three ways that, those are the three chinks in the armor against the general rule that appraisers can't be sued for fraud because an appraiser, appraisal is basically an opinion. Do you have anything to add to that? Look, uh, for, in this particular case, it, the, the court, by sustaining the cause of action, doesn't mean that the appraisers lost the case. Basically, typically speaking, it, it was procedurally in a lawsuit, when you file a complaint against somebody and you plead fraud, there are certain specific requirements that you have to uh, plead with specificity. And if you don't plead with specificity, the, the court can knock it out on what's known as a motion to dismiss. So that means the case doesn't even go any further if you get knocked out on a motion to dismiss. But just by the fact that the court sustains the cause of action, now you have to do something what's called where the defendant now puts in an answer and then we go into discovery. And then years later, at some point, maybe, if the case doesn't settle, the case goes to trial. And then a jury gets to determine fraud. And then and there are certain and there are charges that that get given to a juror to the jury at the end of the case. So it's a long, long road. So uh, just because the court sustained the cause of action doesn't mean necessarily that the appraisal is lost. And usually in a fraud case, one of the classic uh, uh, things that a plaintiff has to prove is that there's reasonable reliance, which is always difficult. There's a difficult standard to meet. So that is, is that if a person is relying on an appraiser's opinion uh, and, 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 and now is claiming that it's fraudulent, well, the question comes down to, did that person reasonably rely on this, uh, on this uh, uh, opinion? Uh, was that person in a position to get his own opinion? Did, you know, uh, et cetera. So I just want to caution you that, that uh, the mere sustaining of a course of action doesn't mean that the case is over. Another thing I want to say in general which is that, and this is to the people who are actually in business, not necessarily the employees, the people who are in business here, uh, I don't know what insurance costs, you know, for professional liability insurance for, for appraisers, but the, one of the best aspects of purchasing insurance, and not that I'm a big insurance guy, uh, is when you have insurance, the insurance company defends you as part of the policy. 
So the defense costs are picked up by the insurance co company. So that's one of the major things that you purchase when you get insurance. Not only if you lose that the insurance company pays. Sometimes the biggest loss that you could sustain is not necessarily what you lose at the end of the case if you lose the case. It's what guys like me cost to defend you. Because, you know, when you start talking about hourly charges, which is what all defense attorneys are going to charge, the costs are, are really very, very high. So that's one you should always consider, even if you're being charged with fraud, if you breach a contract, reasonable reliance, misrepresentation, all these kinds of things. If you have insurance, you can help you sleep better at night. Uh, so I'm looking back on page six of your Kosterich versus Seattle, where they allege an inaccurate comparable. And there the appraiser got off because they were not privy, you know, the plaintiff was not privy to the contract. In this case here, you have a, a direct misrepresentation of certain mm -hmm. material facts, so the standard of proof for fraud is much higher and has to be more concrete than the Seattle Oh, case. well, wait. That's a great question. And it, it's, it's a great question, and I was going to say, not only do I feel guilty about skipping, but the truth is I probably was right in the office when I wrote this because I shouldn't have skipped. Because let's go to page 13. I'm answering your question. I'm not ignoring it. FDIC versus Hoyle. Okay? This case is in here. It's, now, this is interesting. It's the Eastern District. Uh, it's the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York. So now we're not even in state court. This is a federal court case. And um, it's kind of really pretty straightforward case in that the, the it's the FDIC and they asserted claims for the following things breach of contract negligence and negligent misrepresentation in connection with the defendant's appraisal of real property now here's why it's it's kind of a simple case why because the appraiser defaulted this one probably didn't have insurance and didn't have an insurance company and he just he or she the company just didn't uh, show up. So they didn't defend themselves and they lose because they didn't defend themselves. But I have it in here because um, the court conducted what is known as an inquest where they wanted to make sure that the plaintiff, that the FDIC when they were suing, did everything right before they found against this appraiser. So I thought it was a good case because it goes through the elements of different causes of action that appraisers get sued for. And, and I'm coming back around. The first thing I talk about is breach of contract. So now, to get, to get sued for breach of contract, the court is going to look for four elements. And the plaintiff's lawyer has to put in the complaint four elements. You always have to have these four elements. That a contract existed. I'm on page 14 under breach of contract. That the contract, the, the existence of an agreement that the plaintiff did adequate performance, so I didn't drop the ball, because that could be an excuse why you dropped the ball, so the plaintiff performed adequately, that the contract was breached, and that the defendant got damaged. Someone earlier said, well, there was no harm. It, it, that's an element of breach of contract. So in that first case, that Costrich, that was a breach of contract case, and that's what was getting dismissed, because he was saying, well, I'm not in your contract, so you can't sue me under a contract theory. Um, and I think one other thing I wanted to say that this case, if you do want to read any case, FDIC versus Hoyle, it's in the back in order. I don't have the page number in front of me. Um, but it, it lays out what are the things appraisers can get sued for. And under breach of contract, it also goes into the standard of how is breach measured? What does it mean that you breached? And of course, under New York law, a professional performing work under a contract applied, impliedly agrees to use reasonable care and skill and the completion of the contractual duties, and then you look at USPAP. So, you, so whether or not you complied with USPAP comes into whether or not you breached a contract. But like I said, Kostrich got pulled out on a technicality because he wasn't even in the they uh, are the, direct parties. Yeah, he wasn't part of the contract. These cases here, they are direct right. parties to a contract. Right. So now in this one. He, he, he is uh, a direct 
party to this contract. Of course, he's not there to defend himself, so whatever they say is true, but they just wanted to make sure they properly pleaded everything. Um, and in this one, the complaint alleges that the defendant selected comparable sales uh, that were not, were functionally not the most similar to the subject property, that one of the comparables was a new two family, even though the subject property was a single family. So they're showing this is stuff that was in the complaint that means, yes, they've proven it. And they, they also prove damages because uh, the bank made a loan that it otherwise would have. Then there's another thing that FDIC was also going after this appraiser for, negligence. Negligence is different than breach of contract. Negligence is a tort, which is uh, just a general wrong in the law. And to show negligence, you have to show, I'm on page 15 under negligence, a duty on the part of the defendant to the plaintiff. So this comes up again and again when you're trying to see if an appraiser has liability. Did he have a duty? And that's kind of what they were trying to do in Costrich, saying you had a separate duty, but that it just didn't work. Two, that there was a breach of that duty. Three, that the plaintiff was injured because of the breach. So um, the element of duty for appraisers is established because they are professionals and just like real estate appraisers, they assume a duty of care to the financing party that they know is going to rely on the appraisal. On the appraisal. So again, compliance with use PAP forms part of an appraiser's ordinary professional obligation to prepare credible and reliable appraisers. So in this, so I, I don't want to do too much reading to you, but in this case, the court said the defendant's duty of care extended specifically to plaintiff because the defendants knew that the appraisal would be used by the lender for the purposes of the loan. The defendant's failure to comply with USPAP constitutes a breach of the duty to plaintiff, and the defendants in this case prepared an appraisal that inflated the property's value by $177,000. The inflated figure resulted from defendants' failure to choose appropriate comparables and failure to disclose the comparables and past transfer histories, and both actions were in violation of USPAP, and as a result, um, they made a loan they otherwise wouldn't. So that's negligence. So, okay, and let's do the next one before I make a general comment. Well, let me make a general comment. The point is, the same activity gave rise to do two different theories of liability. One is breach of contract, because he had a contract to do this appraisal and do it right, and he, he breached the contract, and the plaintiff did what it was supposed to, and they were harmed, the four elements over there. And the same activities led to a cause of action for negligence, which is there is this implied duty in the law that if I'm working for you as an appraisal, as a professional, either it's a certain duty of care and that's use PAP and he didn't live up to it and because of that they got injured. So breach of contract negligence and now we're on to the other thing he got sued for which was negligent misrepresentation. So. I'm on the bottom of page 15. A claim for negligent misrepresentation um, requires that the underlying relationship between the parties be one of contract or the bond between them so close as to be the functional equivalent of contractual privity. And then you also need awareness by the person making the statement that the statements are going to be used for a particular purpose, which is kind of what we got here. Reliance and conduct by the declarant linking it to the re, to the relying party and evincing its understanding on that reliance wait go ahead so my follow-up question would be that in a case such as costa rich it's extremely unlikely that tort law would be invoked because there was no contractual relationship no it's two separate things contract was what he got off on either that you know, nephew or son or whoever Kostrich was, remember we said he had the same name as the uh, plaintiff. That person didn't sue in tort. He might have been much better off doing so based on this. Because according to this, but then we get back to your language. Putting, putting aside the language that says, this is only for the lender, guys. This is not for the homeowner. You can have a copy, but it's not for you. This is being done for the lender. Without that language in there, the point is, is that the, the prospective um, mortgagor could, there might be a duty, there might have been a duty. 
I mean, he should have sued for negligence, and he should have sued for negligent misrepresentation. I don't know if it would work, but the point is that's what we often do as lawyers. You, you see the situation, you see the facts, and your job is to put those facts into a cognizable legal claim. So it's something. And a lot of times I, I spend time, I'm like, I know this is something. I just don't know what it is, and you have to look at it and think about it it has to do with the relationship between the parties. It has to do with the facts. But, um, and it's all connected to the fact that this is how we settle disputes in the legal system. A lawyer's job when a client comes in is to find, and, and the client asks you to bring a lawsuit, a lawyer's job is to come up with every conceivable scenario by which somebody can be found liable. So when we get to the <coughs> distinction between contract and tort, um, and you have this concept of privity of contract, so if you have the privity of contract disclaimer, you can't sue for contract. But that doesn't insulate you from a tort claim. So if the, if, if the behavior will support a tort claim, Negligence, say negligence. Yeah, with negligence claim, uh, then, uh, okay, you got you got rid of the contract, will be, but you still can be held liable <coughs> for negligence, and that can be uh, as bad, if not worse, than a tort claim. A uh, contract claim. Uh, 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 yeah, the, the negligence claim can be worse than a contract claim. So Because the contract might have liquidated damages. And, and, and he, here's the other thing. You can't contract yourself out of a negligence claim. That's against public policy. I learned this a long time ago. You know, so like if you go into a pool or, or a health club and you know, all these disclaimers, if you use our equipment, uh, you use it at your own risk. No, if you go in there and you get on somebody's equipment and it's, it, it's not maintained and it malfunctions when you're, wor when you're working out on it, and you break your arm, yeah, you can sue for negligence. Oh, but what about that claim? What about the contract which said you, you, you're, you, you've, you've, you, you're doing this at your own risk? No. As a matter of public policy, courts will not enforce uh, language that precludes a negligence claim. So that's why you see, when you look at these cases, you'll see a contract claim and you'll see a tort claim, uh, or a negligence claim. And one might prevail and one might not prevail. I have a question for you. Why, why the difference between negligence and negligent misrepresentation? Why bother doing both of those? And negligent misrepresentation uh, is a claim. Uh, it's a different standard. And I, I don't. Uh, it's right here. Okay. Awareness by the declarant that the statement is to be used for a particular purpose. Reliance. Reliance by a known party on the statement in furtherance of that purpose, and some conduct by the declarant linking it to the reliant, to the reliant party. So, uh, a misrepresentation is a misstatement of a particular fact. Okay, so. Uh, I, I, I praise a house, and uh, uh, I say it has a pool, and it doesn't have a pool. <clears throat> and I credit, I, I credit the appraisal $150,000, notwithstanding the fact that somebody here doesn't like pools and thinks it's worth less money. Uh, uh, I've, I've credited it, but guess what? The house didn't have a pool at all. So I've now up, up the uh, appraisal by $150,000. That. You know, so how did that happen? That means I didn't visit the house. I wrote there's a pool, or if I wrote there's an elevator and there's no elevator. I know why. Uh, that's, that, that's where you get into a negligent misrepresentation, as opposed to a negligence claim might be, uh, there's a comparable on the next block uh, that's $10,000 more, but I've said the comparable is $150,000 more. Well, that might be a mistake. It, it, and also, you don't need the duty in negligent misrepresentation. You need the duty in negligence. 
Here you just need a negligent misrepresentation comes out of a relationship. Um, the underlying relationship between the parties is, uh, might be one of contract or the bond between them is close to be the functional equivalent of contractual privity. So I think the takeaway on this, what I wanted to say is, on this whole case, is don't default when you get sued. But also um, that, and you, it's, it's amazing because your question came right at the right time. The whole purpose of me putting this here was out of the same set of facts, you can be sued for different things. So this case covered contract, negligence, and negligent misrepresentation, which really is kind of a hybrid in the sense it's about a relationship, but it's also about um, a tortious <laughs> act of misrepresenting.